Okay, hello everybody. Um, we're going to be talking with uh, Captain Ron Patrick. Uh, Ron is a um, A and P. He's in uh, IA. He's also an ATP and an airline captain. He, <laughs> he grew up in Michigan on an airstrip, so this guy knows yeah. about cold weather flying. And uh, <laughs> Ron's been gracious enough to. Uh, he's going to uh, answer a few questions uh, about uh, cold weather procedures for uh, little airplanes. So. Um, Ron, uh, first of all, thanks for coming. And, You're welcome. Uh, yeah, glad to be here. Yeah. So, so my first question is to you: What is the uh, minimum temperature you would um, fly without preheating, or, or when do you recommend preheating? Me, like coming or continental? Okay, me personally. You or personally. Like, okay, me personally. Uh, well, back on the farm in Michigan, we would we would actually drain the oil out of the oil sump when we got done flying into a clean bucket or you know pail. And then we'd take it inside the house so the next time we flew because we always wanted more warm oil but that's when it was really cold out um, which you'll find out as we talk about cold weather operations that that's really critical i know a lot of people will talk about preheating but uh, preheating the cylinders or just warming the cylinders up for a little bit and maybe not getting the oil warm um, really is a gives you a false sense of security for the engine and we can talk about that in a minute but for me personally um, Gosh, if it's kind of like below 40, I kind of like to, to heat the oil up and uh, heat the whole engine up. Um, depending on whether you uh, run multi-vis, Kasi oil, or a straight oil, straight weight oil, makes a big difference too. You know, most people are running um, multi-viscosity, and so that does help. And we can talk about that, but uh, if you look at the Lycoming service instructions, um, they say... I'm not a fan of that, to be honest with you. Um, they say, I like homing is like, if it's below 10, uh, below 10 degrees Fahrenheit, they want you to preheat the engine, and the Continental is 20. 10 and 20 degrees Fahrenheit is pretty cold to, uh, to start an engine without preheat. You're, you're wearing it. And, uh, and just a little caveat here, that's like saying, hey, my cylinder temperature range, uh, like homing says, it's 460 degrees Fahrenheit, I can run that hot. And if you do, you will never get your engine to TBO. Uh, so, not preheating your engine uh, until it gets to that temperature, 10 or 12, uh, 20 degrees, you're going to have the same issues. There, there's going to be issues. There's going to be severe wear. You might not see it right away, but you will see it eventually. Okay. Yeah. So, obviously, 40 degrees, I, I think that's a, a, a really good con number. And mm -hmm. so, let's say we're out on a camp out at Rogers, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and we wake up and it's 35 degrees. Okay, and we have multi viscosity oil. Yeah. Okay, I mean 40 is your you know ideal. Yeah. What, what what what's the minimum you would start your airplane if you're on the road and you don't have access to a premium? Well, if I have to get home, I'm going to start my engine. You know. But I mean, if you don't have to, if you but, don't if you don't have to, I, I have started like you know I've started this this engine this Aerostar. They're, they're 540s, just like in a lot of your airplanes uh, have 540 engines, like homing. 520 Continentals, same, really same, same uh, air-cooled engine technology. But we've all turned, we've all, you know, have, this is my minimum. And then it's like, well, I guess I can, you know, skirt that a little bit. So for me, I, I guess probably if I got down close to like the like homing says 20 degrees, uh, I'm gonna have a hard time starting my engine here uh, if it's 20 degrees out without a preheat because I know there's gonna be some wear. Oh yeah. And I can tell you, when you get to the, if you get to that question, I can tell you why it's gonna give you a lot of wear. Um, and probably most people here I'm talking to, uh, you guys know, you've been around as, probably as, some of you longer than I have. So it's one man's opinion, experience, and also, you know, being an AMP and an IA, it's, you know, I just, I'll give you what I know, but okay. that's my opinion. Sure. Um, so do not let your RPM come up. I hear people out here on the airport right. and they'll start it up and it's rah, especially like students because they don't probably know any better. But you just raced your engine without wheel pressure. Yeah. I always go, oh my God, that somebody did that again, you know? And uh, yeah, it's rough. Yeah. I remember when I was learning to fly in Cincinnati and you know, all the planes were outside mm -hmm. and they preheat, you know, with the, yeah. the gas heater when it was really, really cold. Yeah. But on a just average cold day, I'd see uh, the instructors and stuff pulling the prop through. Is that mm -hmm. doing anything, or is that helping or hurting? Or I'm not sure why. I mean, I used to watch my dad pull the prop through, especially on the on the you know the smaller engines like an Aronica Champ or you know O200 or 
you know, 0235, those kind of engines, 320 maybe even. Um, I guess if you pulled it through, you, you know, the oil pump's pushing some oil through. Um, my dad would do it, like he would, he would prime the engine. We can talk about priming. He would prime the engine and then he would leave the, the uh, ignition off and then he'd pull the prop through, you know, six or eight times and then okay. contact, start, and it would start right up. So I know there's a school of thought on that. I'm not sure, you know, someone said one time, it, it, if you, when you prime it, it kind of starts mixing the air fuel. And I, I guess maybe that's true, but uh, I'll leave for you guys to judge if that helps. If it helps on your airplane, then do it. If it doesn't, yeah. then I... So your dad was kind of priming it also, not just yeah, loosening the oil. Yeah, he would, he would prime it and pull the prop through several sure. times. And, and you, you'll see a lot of old timers. Actually, my dad would have been 102 yesterday. Wow. He was a B-29 co-pilot in World War II. That's amazing. I learned to fly on a little grass strip. And yeah, he, he was always like, flip it, flip it. And, and a lot of you guys know that's what you do, is you flip it, flip it, and then you go in there and you turn the ignition switch on and it would usually pull it would usually kick on the first or second blade yeah so yeah i'd have to agree it probably does help you know mixing the air fuel ratio and stuff because that's really the key is getting the right air fuel ratio mixture right you know so when you talk later we talked about hot starts or winning time hard starts it's really about getting the ratio right so it'll fire you know yeah yeah okay speaking of that every every year if we hear of one or two incidents uh of somebody uh, having an engine fire starting it in the severe cold weather. Yeah. What's that about? What are they doing wrong? Okay. Yeah. And as a mechanic, I've seen uh, um, the carburetor air box, you know, where the air filter is and you have your carburetor heat, cold and carburetor heat uh, valve there. So that box is aluminum. It attaches to the bottom of the carburetor. And a lot of time, uh, several times I've seen that whole carburetor box stained blue. And so, you know, you know, that's 100 low lead. It's the stain on 100 low lead. Sure. So, in a carburetor, you also have, now the MA3, the smaller carburetors, they don't have an accelerator pump. But most of the, the people we're talking to here have airplanes that have, a carbur that have a carbureted engine, have an accelerator pump in the carburetor, like an MA4 has a pump in it. And that just means um, when you push the throttle in, there's a plunger in there on the side of the bowl and it pushes fuel up through a little orifice. And in the throat of the carburetor, there's this little, there's this little valve and it shoots, it shoots fuel. And I mean, it'll shoot it across the hangar here. Like if I had a carburetor, I'd demonstrate it. I could hit somebody over there 20 feet away, no problem. So when you push the throttle in all the way and pull it back, you just pushed a slug of fuel up through that, through that carburetor uh, accelerator pump. And um, where's it gonna go? it goes into the plenum and falls back down through the carburetor, past the butterfly, and then back into the uh, carburetor heat box. And so somebody that's out there priming the heck out of it, maybe throttle pumping it like that. If you push the throttle in and back three or four times, you've probably put, I didn't measure it, but I would say, yeah, three or four or five tablespoons of fuel that just fell back down. So then when you go to start, and, and some of you will understand this, the, the ignition system on an airplane is set. It's, a, it's not, unless you have an uh, ignition system that's electronic, it's set at a certain timing point. And that is so many degrees before the piston comes all the way to top dead center, okay? So what happens is you just sprayed a bunch of fuel in there with you, maybe you pumped it. Like an old truck, you'd, you know, some of the young guys might not know this and gals, but the older people like us, would know, you know, you hit the gas pedal four or right. five times and then you're and it starts, yeah. it's the same, same situation. So now you got all this raw fuel, it just fell back down through the carburetor because you it squirted into the plenum, fell back down to the carburetor and now you go to crank it and the spark plug is firing before top dead center, you get a backfire or whatever and, um, and it ignites out of fire. And of course the fire follows through the valve right down into the carburetor and you got pooled uh, hunter loaded there, and it's like, woof, now you have a serious in a fire there. And uh, that's what's happened out here. It's happened around the country. I've seen it personally. I've seen a, a whole airplane burn to the ground. And um, the best thing you can do is if you hear a woof like that, like a little, like, a little, like something lit off, like if you started a campfire and you get that, yep. you, or, your, or your grill, mm -hmm. and you get that little woof, if you hear something like that, keep cranking because you'll you'll be pulling the engine will be pulling air through up in, in air through the engine 
uh, and through the heat box. And so if there's a fire there, you'll suck the fire out up into the engine. If you stop and go, oh my God, what just happened? Let me look and see. Yeah, you're probably gonna have to leave the airplane. It's gonna burn up. Okay. Yeah. So obviously if you see a fire out there, get out of the airplane or, but if you think it's just the beginning, yeah. keep cranking. Keep cranking. If you, yeah, yeah cranking is, is the issue. If you will keep cranking, you won't have a fire. Okay. Unless you really flooded. Like if you got, you know, I've seen it puddling on the ground. Yeah. And if you have, if you have puddled Hunter Lola on the ground, and it catches fire, you know it's gonna catch fire there too. You ain't gonna put that fire out. Yeah. You know, so you're gonna to have to get out and you know hope for the best. Fire okay. extinguisher maybe, but um, yeah. Okay, so uh, so let's say a guy realizes, oh yeah, I've been working too hard on this. I've overprimed the hell out of it yeah. and everything. How do I back myself out of this situation? Uh, it's, all right, it's real simple. And this, this so even with hot starts and um, over priming like you like say it, it fired and it kicked again you're like ah shoot you know so i'll prime it again prime it prime it you did it and you're not sure so the question is and this happens to all of us i don't know what the condition of the engine is like i don't know if there's too much fuel in there or maybe it's not enough you know and that happens to all of us so and this is ron patrick's line of thinking sometimes I, if i just don't know i'm like well you know what i'm gonna put it in a flooded condition and then i'm gonna do a flooded engine start okay situation you know uh uh, what do you call it? The steps, right? Right. And everybody knows this for mo for the most part. So you would, you know, turn the ignition off. You would uh, push the throttle all the way in, right? Now you just squirted more fuel in there, so you got more fuel in there on top of it if you're flooded. You're going to pull the mixture all the way out, so you're not introducing any more fuel in there. Okay, and then you're going to start cranking the engine. So those that have uh, typical Cessna or Piper, where you have you know off, left, right, both, and then start. All you can do is crank it and it'll start when it's ready to start. You know, when the fuel air mixture gets to the point that it's that it's ready to, there's not too much fuel or there's not enough, then it'll kick off on you. So that's really the only way to do it. And you might crank it and the problem, you might crank it a, lot, a long time, like maybe 30, 40, 50 seconds or something. And I would limit the cranking to maybe like 30 seconds is a long time. If you limit to 30 seconds, and then just wait. Don't pull the throttle back because when you push it in again, you're gonna introduce more fuel. Okay. And uh, yeah. And when it gets to the right fuel mixture, it'll start to kick, you know. And then and then it'll usually kick. And if somebody's watching, you probably get black smoke out the exhaust. Yeah. Black smoke always means uh, you know too much fuel. Too much fuel. Yeah. And then when it catches, you do the reversal yep. of the mixture. And the exactly. The as soon as it catches, then you want to pull the throttle back. And you don't have to be quick on the mixture. Okay. It might vary from, with your airplane. You can get get used to your own airplane. How you know how. It has its own little temperament, but yeah, reverse it. So I'd pull the throttle back immediately and maybe crack it a half inch or a quarter inch. And then as it as it starts to clear out and stuff, then you need to come in with your mixture. Yeah. But just don't whip them, you know, throttle back mixture forward because you could probably flood it, still flood it. Yeah. Okay. And like I know this is, this is kind of taboo, but we do it. If you're going to throttle prime your engine, you need to do it while you're starting it. Okay because at least when, when you push the throttle in and your accelerator pump shoots a big spray of fuel in there, the engine, if it's cranking, is gonna go, I'm accepting that, and it's pulling it into the cylinders right. versus not cranking it and that fuel's falling back down like we just talked. So if you only got one primer line or, one, or you don't have any, then crank it, and I would, just like an old truck or something, I'd probably do you know two or three or four, like one, two, three, like that, while and back while you're cranking, while you're cranking it. it um, don't, two things for me. If you if you can't preheat, don't let your engine run hard or run fast. Keep the RPMs extremely low until you warm up, um, and use multi vis oil, and because you will get lubrication, that'll flow really easy at 20 degrees temperature. Versus if you have a 50 weight, I have over here at 50 degrees, it's like pouring syrup. I mean, it just barely comes out, and you're you're gonna have issues there. So yeah, those are my two probably big takeaways. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, preheat if you can. If you can't, you know, don't don't let it run hard. Use multivis. Yeah, that that's the big thing, you know. And uh, all right, yeah, all right. Well, thank you very much, Ron. <laughs> all right, here, and we appreciate it. All right, safe flying, yes. everybody.